summer in southeast Alaska means long days for the Coast Guard. When a man is violently thrown from his off-road vehicle, the Coast Guard swoops in. He's been laying on the ground for four or five hours. You know, you're thinking he's hypothermic. Uh, he's got a broken back. You know, who knows what he's feeling. Out in the open waters near Sitka, a sightseeing vessel has flooded. Limited information has passed at this point. We do know that we've got 84 people on board. And a helicopter crew tackles back-to-back -back rescues in the remote Alaskan wilderness. Especially up here in Alaska, you never know what you're going to get. Later, got a spin to it. Hang on, she's just don't want her to get sick. The vast Alaskan wilderness, a place where beauty is cloaked by danger. Here, every day, the highly trained men and women of the U.S. Coast Guard risk their lives to save others. America's deadliest waters are protected by Coast Guard Alaska. The yeah, actually looks good, but they couldn't get a uh, fixed-wing aircraft in there because of an icy strip. That's why we're going up there. Lieutenant Andy Clayton, Air Station Sitka, Alaska, and we were responding to a medevac for an ATV accident up near Yakutat. Questions, comments? He uh, wrecked his ATV near a landing strip in Dry Bay, which is at the mouth of the Alsic River. It's uh, probably about 30 miles outside of Yakutat. It's a very remote area and uh, used a lot for fishing and recreation. Crew part ready for takeoff? Ready for takeoff. Chris, what did they say about altitude? They were concerned of an altitude restriction. On the way back with the patient? Yeah, oh, but uh, if he's in that much pain, try to keep it relatively low. That way his body can absorb most of that oxygen a little bit better. Oh. OK, all right. My name's uh, Chris Palau. I'm a Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer at Air Station Sitka in southeast Alaska. As the case that came across to us was just an ATV accident with a broken back, a 61-year-old male. We don't know how bad it really is. He's stuck under the ATV. I mean, there's so many things that could happen. All right, Maya, so what are you thinking? Well, I guess it really depends on how he crashed it. And I mean, I guess we'll see how shocking he is. Yeah. It's Maya's first Alaska qualified case, and it's probably a really good one for her. It's a pretty big trauma case, and it's someplace far and deep in the Alaskan bush. So what do you want to do to him? Go ahead and get a package backward, make sure you call her. My name is Maya Dejnakul. I'm a health service technician, third class. Knowing that it's a trauma, we need to get him in a sea collar right away. He could have some damage to his spine, and also I'm really concerned about internal bleeding. Just we don't know how how fast he was moving when he crashed and what what's broken inside. I think this happened at 6:30 this morning. Yeah. And we're looking at three hours. I definitely start an IV on him. Yeah. Okay. Chris Blyle and myself, when we're en route in the helicopter, we were essentially just trying to make a plan for what we were going to do when we got on scene. We're both the same level of medical training, so we're working together as a team. So pretty up here. Yeah, the snow blowing off the top there. Yeah. Yeah, that looks like the uh, 10,400 footer. Yeah. This place makes you feel pretty small. Yep. Okay, uh, about 20 minutes out. Roger. You pull the gun away, or somebody that knows much, figure out what will all happen. Okay. I'll start with the full sweep and do all that kind of assessment. You're expecting the worst. He's, he's been laying on the ground for four or five hours. He's, you know, you're thinking he's hypothermic. He's got a broken back. You know, who knows what he's feeling? We're ready for approach. Ready for approach. Keep your eyes peeled, guys, on the right. We have people dead ahead. They're talking about a little grass area. I got door speed, right, sir? Yeah, you do. All right. Clear, clear down on my side. Okay. It's real wet and heavy here. No worries with the snow. All right. My name is Lieutenant Simon Green. I'm a pilot here at Air Station Sitka. Luckily, he was right off a little strip, a little dirt strip. It's covered with snow, slush, uh, still pretty heavy winter in Yakutat. As I'm getting off the plane, I'm looking around and, and kind of taking a, a view of the scene, seeing if it's safe. Uh, luckily, he was kind of out in the fields. The ATV, they just kind of rolled it out of the way. Perfect. 
down here like this for quite some time, huh? When you make first contact with the patient, you know, obviously the first thing you do is calm them down. This is, this is a hell of a day. I mean, you know, in the middle of nowhere, helicopters coming to rescue you. I mean, a lot of things going on. They're hurting, they're in pain. Uh, it's stressful, it's, it's scary. was just getting through with the rapid trauma assessment. I came over to help him get the C collar on the patient. So at that time, I was kind of able to crouch down and get a word in with the patient, see how he was feeling. He was able to hold a conversation with me, and he was obviously alert and oriented to the situation. He was unable to move, but he was able to move his arms, which to me was a really good sign. Did you see I finally was able to interview the son and the pilot on scene who was a friend and get some more information. He told me that there was a lot of ice over the airstrip. When he went from the ice to the mud, his ATV caught in the mud and rolled, and he hit himself on the his chest, mainly on the handlebars. Thankfully, he rolled clear of the ATV and was not rolled over by it. We're going to roll you towards me on this side, OK? So check your back real quick. We're going to put you on this back. Chris Belisle, the rescue swimmer, is really a master of kind of staying calm and calming the patient, even though it is a really scary and serious situation. I think that's a really uh, great skill to have. You know, uh, a little bit closer towards the end of the grass patch, right over here would be good, and then we'll have all these guys can help us carry it. Nice and slow and easy, just up and over, guys. Three, two, three. He's a big Alaskan guy. Having the more people to help carry him out is, is you know, helps great. All right, all our peeps are in. We're all in, sir. We are uh, ready to take off. Okay. We'll come up uh, on we'll this pedal turn. Clear to continue, your power is real good. Correct. Right. Sector 6030, uh, be advised, we're airborne again with the patient. 030, let's go to Sector Junior, roger. If we go direct from that position to Sitka, it's 163 nautical miles. If we go to that position right there, and then direct to Juno, because we don't want to go over the 13,000 foot mountain, that's a difference of 16 miles. Juno just has a higher level of spinal care. Yeah. We had two options, either to take him to Juno or Sitka. The biggest concern was we wanted a smooth ride for the patient. He had a possible broken back, so we wanted a smooth ride. What's our transit time? One hour from right now. Roger that. We were responding to a medevac for an ATV accident up near Yakutat. We were able to take some shortcuts, but we weren't able to go direct because in between us and Juneau was Mount Fairweather at 15,300 feet. So to climb up to that kind of altitude and fly around the mountain, we would have no doubt got tossed by the winds. Maya, can you put the left side on? I'll do the center and right. His blood pressure is a little high, but that's normal. Once we got into the helicopter, our main focus was essentially that he was stable, make sure that he wasn't going to shock or having any other conditions that we couldn't see on the outside. He's complaining of clavicle pain radiating down around to the back. Once we got the patient loaded, uh, our biggest concern for him is really keeping him comfortable. It's not going to be very easy. He's laying on a solid aluminum backboard, and they're usually pretty receptive. They understand, you know, they're living in the middle of nowhere, and. When we come and see him, we're the last resort, and they know it's pretty bad. You want to try to do one of these? Uh, yeah, we can get our shot. He's got a steel plate in his arm. Oh, uh, okay. They rebuilt this whole rim. I think in the hand, I don't, that doesn't look very good to me. All right. Once we had him stabilized, we could tell he was definitely slightly dehydrated. And especially when anyone has a trauma, um, you really should start an IV just in case they do start developing symptoms of shock. You want to be ready to treat them. Sector Juno, rescue 6030, channel 16. 
Coast Guard Site, Dojuna, roger. Please advise ambulance, uh, meet us at Aero Services in approximately two, five, 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 five. The transit's been relatively short. I think it's just over an hour. Uh, beautiful, clear day. If you're a pilot or an air crew in Alaska, you came up here to challenge yourself. But those dark and stormy nights are only fun after the fact, uh, when everything goes well and you're back on deck. A flight like today, in nice weather, the whole process is fun. Ready for approach. Roger. So how's everything feeling? Is it still just your localized pain in your yeah, chest? Like it's stabbing towards the heart, but it shoots it. Like shoots. And there's the ambulance, perfect. The ambulance crew is just one more team on a really huge chain of survival for these individuals. It's one of these amazing, really intricate situations that works like clockwork here in Alaska. All right, Gary, it was a pleasure meeting you. I'm sorry it was in these kind of uh, situations, but... I was really lucky to have this case as my first medevac. We had amazing weather. We had a very compliant patient. And I also had Chris Belisle as my rescue swimmer, which he's just a very experienced swimmer. It really feels good to know that you help someone. He was so happy that we were there, and it just really made, makes you feel good. Maya, good job. Thanks, sir. My name's Gary Gray, and I'm from Yakutat. Where I had my accident, I was like 45 miles from Yakutat, and there's no way to get there other than a helicopter or a plane, but the runways were all ice. I couldn't walk. I had broken bones next to my spine. You always think it's gonna be somebody else, but uh, I've seen the choppers go by day after day for years, and when they come to get you, it's very nice. I'm very thankful that the Coast Guard come the day we called. The pretty much only choice we have. My family and I all appreciate it and thank you, Coast Guard. Cheers. Good morning. My name's uh, Chris Bly. I'm a Coast Guard rescue swimmer at Air Station Sitka. I'm used to seeing everything from about 500 feet up, so being up on a boat and dry is actually a uh, new experience for me and quite fun. Does anybody have any sailing experience? I know that that's fore and that's aft, and that's starboard and that's port, and that is all I know. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Jamie Jenks, Air Station Sitka. We're going out sailing today. I know how to fly a helicopter. I don't know how to sail a boat at all. What we do locally here is all aviation related, and today we're gonna get to raise the sails and do something interesting um, from a totally different perspective. And we're gonna put the main up first, followed by the fore, then the jib and the staysail. Captain John gave us a lot of instruction. He did use a lot of nautical terms, making the assumption that being in the Coast Guard, we knew what the heck we were doing, which is certainly not uh, an assumption he should have made. Hold it, hold it, that's not the peak. We helped raise and lower the sails. Okay, now work, work together. You ready? <laughs> Putting us through the ropes. Mr. Jenks and I were working on unfurling the sail, getting ready to hoist the jib, which is the forward one. No, 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 no. Let's leave that off yet. That, that's a staysail. We're talking to the jib. You're, you're doing it all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Having Chris here is great. He and I have a really fun work relationship. I enjoy standing duty with him. Climb up the ratlins, climb down the other side. They just went up one side, down the other? Yeah. You're next. Okay. All right. Definitely more work than I expected. He had us testing out climbing up the rat lines, just kind of seeing our familiarity and all of this. Wait, how do you transition to the other side? You man up. If you're not comfortable doing it, you can end it at any time. Yeah, no, I think I'm all set. I don't think I'm going to do that. <laughs> I definitely chose the correct career path in the uh, Coast Guard. I'm certainly more comfortable wiggling the sticks of an H-60. <laughs> <laughs> we're going up a fjord, and then we're going to sail out towards Mount Edgecombe. Uh, I took out the Coast Guard because I thought it'd be cool as heck. Thanks, you guys. Thank you for flying. I took a ride with your crew. 
All right. You know, they're essential, essential here in the community. We would have an amazing amount of casualties in this community if we didn't have the Coast Guard here, just flat out. All right, so is everybody up to speed on what we're doing? There's a boat taking on water with 84 people on board. When you hear the call, 80 people that could potentially be in the water, our sense of urgency increases greatly because um, that's a critical situation no matter what the case is. Man, there's a lot of people on a little tiny boat. I'm Lieutenant Mike Snyder. I'm a pilot at Air Station Sitka. This was one of those cases where initially we didn't really know what was going on, and as we got more information, they diverted us up to Glacier Bay for a uh, vessel named the Baranoff Wind, and it was actually 84 people on board. They had run aground and flooded at least one of the voids on the boat and were taking on water and needed to basically get those people off the boat. So we knew there was a pretty good chance that we were going to have to give them a dewatering pump. Yeah, I've spoken to the Baranoff Wind, and uh, they are offloading all of their passengers onto a tender from the cruise ship Volendam. Estimated time for that to happen is 30 minutes from now. Over. Is there any injuries involved in the uh, accident? Over. Yeah, update on medical situation on the Baranoff Wind. Eight passengers uh, requiring general first aid. One person with a head injury, good dilation of pupils, but doesn't remember falling. We got the report that there was possibly a head injury. And whenever you hear that, our sense of urgency increases greatly, because that's a critical situation, no matter what the case is. Dr. Juno, Rescue 30, be advised, we are reporting on scene at this time. I'm going to give us a mark once we fly over here for the position. Man, there's a lot of people on a little tiny boat. Baird off wind, Baird off wind. Coast Guard helicopter channel 1-6, how do you copy? Coast Guard helicopter, Baird off wind. Yeah, Baird off wind, I've just got a few questions. Ask about the two medical personnel as well, sir. Is this a head injury and an ankle injury, is that correct? Yeah, our evac is a knee sprain, non-life-threatening, non-limb-threatening. Her head injury is, was cleared, and uh, we're just going to transfer her in our vessel down to uh, go see a doctor. Okay, so there's not, just to make sure we understand this correctly, there's not a head injury that's critical. That's 10-4. There were a couple relatively minor injuries from when the ship ran aground. In this particular case, those passengers were okay, so we were trying to figure out the best way to get the pump to the bare enough wind without preventing them from safely getting all those people off. There was a Forest Service boat on scene, and there was a uh, tender from the Volendam, which was a large cruise ship that was up in Glacier Bay at the time. We talked to the Forest Service boat. It was pretty rocky, but they said that they could get real close with their, they had an aluminum boat. What might work, it'd be really easy for us to land on the beach here, and uh, we could just give you the pop, but in the meantime, we could be saving some fuel. Is that something you're capable of doing, is uh, getting up on the beach with that boat? Yeah, 10-4. Uh, sounds like the plan won't be there. Upon arrival on scene, we asked the Ranger boat, which is an aluminum boat, if they could get right up uh, next to the shore. When they confirmed that they could, then it was really a no-brainer for us. We landed on the beach. Right about here. Yes, sir, that should be good. And then we're planning on getting the pump to the Ranger boat, and then they could just drive it over to the Baranoff Wind, the vessel taken on water. Our swimmer just went waist deep in the water, handed it off to the boat. They delivered it successfully, and we were standing by until everybody was safely on board the tender at that point. Sector Juno, Rescue 30, be advised, we are airborne from our previous location. We are traversing to go and make sure that the passenger transfer at the vessel Volendam goes well, and we'll be on scene with the Volendam until that's complete. In Alaska, the Mariner community is really tight-knit. What would have been a pretty big lift for us became a pretty simple assist because of everybody looking out for each other on the Alaskan waters. And uh, Bull and Dom, uh, Coast Guard 6030, just wanted to thank you again for the assistance today. 
You guys are a huge help, obviously. Uh, Coast Guard 6030, well, roger on that. Thanks very much for yours. Uh, have a good trip home. When you hear the call, 80 people that could potentially be in the water, the reality of it is this is really serious, and those aren't just imaginary survivors or instructors in the pool. Those are people who need help and people with families. So whenever we hear that there's something that we can do to help somebody, that's our A-game. And even if it is a case where there's other vessels that are helping out to affect the rescue, you're still on your A-game no matter what because anything can change, and that's what we get paid to do. I was going to ask you if I could swim to the boat, sir. I knew you were jumping at the pit, man. I'd fire it. How's the patient? She's in a lot of pain, probably some broken ribs in her back area. On this particular night, we get two medevacs uh, back to back. We have a patient who has fallen down a flight of stairs, broken some ribs. The pain level's pretty high. Roger that. If he's on a decent backboard, then we'll just keep him on. All right. Got to know the last of summer, so we'll be home before it gets dark. Lieutenant Brooks Crawford at Air Station Sitka, and we just heard a pipe that a gentleman in Elfin Cove was on a charter boat, uh, took a pretty big fall, and uh, possibly hurt his back. Before we took off, we had a pretty good look at weather, and it looked like a pretty good day. We were going to try to go as direct as possible, so that's the course we set direct for Elfin Cove up and over the mountains. I think we're all on the same page as to what we got. A 74-year-old uh, man hurt his back on a boat. He said he's at the lodge in Elephant Cove. We'll find this guy. We'll find a place to safely hoist. We'll do it. We'll get him to uh, get him to Juno. Okay. Uh, yeah, 6,500 pounds of fuel. Everything else is the same. Any questions? I have no questions, sir. All right. Red brake is coming off now. Pilot. Echo pilot. Shocks. Shocks are moved. Cabin door closed lock. Move for air taxi. Air taxi. And Marie lift. Roger. Flew right and above. Coming up to 10 plus for hour check. We got everything started, and while we were en route, we started setting up like the litter was actually already set up, but we started getting trail lines, and me and Dave started talking about possible poisoning to the survivor. You guys already got the litter put together? Yeah, you do. I got O2 set up. Got some trail lines set up. Hi. On <laughs> I'm pretty sure I know what the lodge is in Elfin Cove, I and mean, there's only freaking, what, eight buildings in all of Elfin Cove, so. Yeah. Elfin Cove, Elfin Cove, this is Coast Guard Rescue 6038. Uh, this is Eagle Charters, uh, go ahead. Eagle Charters, we're about a minute out from their position. Is there anything you need to pass? Yeah, roger right that. We have a big sandy beach where you could put down, we'll light that area up with a couple flares, and we'll put two flares where you can do a hoist if you so choose, okay? Sandy Beach, huh? Let's ask how far the guy is from the Sandy Beach. If we could land, that'd be great. How far is the, uh, the patient from the Sandy Beach? Oh, probably less than a block. All right. I think uh, we'll take a look at it. I have smoke over there in the cove right now. I don't know if that's, okay. yep, that's yep. a player right there. All right, that looks like they lit up a uh, right there on the dock. Floating boat dock. So as we approached, we saw uh, the spots that were marked by smoke, uh, possible hoisting sites. You do have door speed. Roger, cab door's coming open. Cab door's open and locked. But also they had a gravel beach at low tide that looked like a, a good landing spot. So we talked about it, decided that was probably our best course of action was to try to land on that beach. You know, that would minimize that time involved in getting that patient into the litter. Okay, so I plan on making an approach uh, directly into that uh, skinny beach, beat nose in. Is ready in the back? We are, sir. Ready in the back. I'm just scoping out the area. Okay. Once we're safely on deck there in Elfin Cove, at that point, we cleared Dave White, our rescue swimmer, out to go assess the patient. Once we landed and I left the helicopter, I brought the litter with me and a couple other things, the backboard. There's a lot of people on scene there, and they were all very willing to help out and show me where the patient was. Elvin Cove is a small town. It's all small buildings, all connected by boardwalks. Beautiful town. And the whole town must have come out to watch us land and to lend a hand if I needed them to. Five. 
gentleman told me that he was in one of their hotel rooms on the second floor in a bed. Uh, you know, your name's Ron? Yeah. Hi, Ron. I'm Dave. Hi, right, Dave. All right, so, put your back. Yeah. All right. Hey, Joe. Um, I'm going to get you on a backboard. That might. I'll carry you down, OK? He's got so basically localized sciatic pain with no radiation down this leg. Okay. Do you have any other? Uh, He's had a broken back before. OK. Uh, we're going to take you to Juno. And then drop you off. <laughs> the hospital will deal with you there. Just stay still. Let don't, don't, let don't, the, yeah, don't, don't, don't move, try okay? to move. These guys will do the training. They, they know what they're doing. Did my patient assessment, and he was talking. He was, he was in a lot of pain, which in most cases is a good sign for a back injury. It's the numbness that is bad, very dangerous. OK, now we're going to roll him back. Coming back okay. on the board. OK. Tell us how you're feeling. Sam Kelly, you always wanted to be the center of attention. Bitch, I'm going to tell you something, Bill. I'll trade you places here. <laughs> Uh, got a couple more black straps under here. We gotta get uh, connected and then we'll get him out of here. Uh, you know, Down. All right, so we're gonna go feet first. There's handles here, all up and down it. We're gonna need as many people as possible. Thanks. One, two, three, lift. Lift them up. Okay. I had about eight strong guys in the room with me, so carrying him wasn't gonna be an issue until we got down uh, a flight of stairs. All right, we're going down the stairs. This Bottom of the stairs in this corner is going to be the tricky part. Yeah. Oh boy. Damn, Kelly, I wish you'd lose some weight. There was a wall at the end of the flight of stairs that I didn't think we were going to be able to get around. I didn't see any other option but to just go ahead and give it a try. Wait, wait I'm moving here. We got it on this side. Each guy was on the backboard, and we were just barely able to make that tight turn around that corner. Good job, guys. Good job. Okay. Feet now. first through the door. Yep. Head on that red part of that litter right there. Okay. Once we got the patient into the litter, I tasked a few of the men to help me carry the litter to the helicopter. Luckily, there were enough good Sams there that they helped him carry the survivor back. With me and Dave, if it had just been the two of us, it would have been tremendously hard trying to carry a 200-pound man on unstable ground. You've got soft sand, big rocks. I mean, a couple of us almost fell just trying to carry the survivor. So once we got him back, we put him in the helo feet first. Okay, how's the uh, patient doing? Uh, he's about at eight right now, his pain level, but he's talking, joking, laughing, but his pain level's pretty high. Roger that. I'm gonna give him some uh, O2. Okay. That's about all I can do for him. Have doors closed and locked. Roger. I went ahead and put him on oxygen, put a blanket on him because it gets cold. And it's hard to communicate with patients in the helicopter. You really got to get up close and personal to them and, uh, and yell, literally yell in their ear. Every five minutes, I would talk to him, and, and he said he was OK, he was doing fine. And there's really nothing I could do for his pain level except transport him as fast as possible. Sector Juno, Sector Juno, Coast Guard 6038. Request to know what the nature of the cutback is and also a Latin law of the Cocky River. Shortly after taking off, we get word from Sector Juno that we might be tasked with a second medevac as soon as we land. Three Sector, be advised uh, the nature of the second medevac is a head and neck injury. The on scene Latin long I have for you when you're ready, over. Sector 3A, we are ready to copy, over. Right now, we have a patient on board who's in a lot of pain, possible broken back. And our goal right now is just to get him, first and foremost, to a higher level of care. Hey, Sector Juno, Sector Juno, Coast Guard 6038. Request to know what the nature of the back is and also a Latin law of Pocky River. Shortly after taking off, we get word from Sector Juno that we might be tasked with a second medevac as soon as we land. Right now, we have a patient on board who's in a lot of pain, 
possible broken back. And our goal right now is just to get him, first and foremost, to a higher level of care. As we're on approach to Juno, we see that the EMS is actually already there waiting for us. And we decide to just transfer the patient directly over to the ambulance, keep the head spinning, uh, kind of minimize our time as we uh, transition to this next medevac. My name is Ron Kelly. I'm uh, from Ridgefield, Washington. I went to Alaska to uh, do some good salmon and halibut fishing. And it was going along, but then all of a sudden the bottom just dropped out. Next thing I knew, my head hit the overhead in the boat, and I went right down on my rear end, and it jammed my backbone right up through my hair. It was just the worst, most harsh, violent feeling I've ever experience. It's real scary. I said, well, wow, what, what do we do? He said, well, we call the Coast Guard. Here comes John Wayne, you know, that type of feeling, everything's fine. To all the crew, all the men and women of the Coast Guard, right from the bottom on up, right to, uh, yes, I, I owe them my life. What more can you say? All right, uh, we can regroup here. So you got everything we need? Yes, sir. Cool. We're, uh, we're all up on all our gear. Roger that. On this particular night, we get two medevacs back to back. They tell us that there's somebody who has fallen down a flight of stairs and uh, possibly hurt a back, uh, broken some ribs, and she's up uh, on the Taki River really close to Canada. It's not that far away, but we have six to 8,000 foot mountains in route. The sun is going down at this point, so most likely we're going to be doing a uh, hoist at night. All right, we've got a little bit of time to breathe. Everybody doing all right? Good to go. Now there's a few up there, you guys. Freaking beautiful back here. While en route, we started briefing the current SAR case. We're getting everything set back up for a hoist if need be, because we just didn't know what to expect. Okay, John, do you see that fire? Yep. Uh, yeah, I got some uh, smoke up ahead. Coast Guard helicopter, yes, we see your smoke signal, sir. Uh, this one might be a little uh, harder to land, just so you guys are aware. Right, Looks sir. like uh, it's, uh, a lot of dense trees there. There's doors, Pete. Roger, cabin door coming open. Cabin door is open and locked. The crane is behind the cabin here where the smoke is. Where you say? He said somewhere behind the cabin where the smoke is. Okay. There's no way in hell we're going to get there. All right, sir, where are we looking at? Where these three guys are down here by the two-story cabin? Well. Right here at our 3 o'clock where all the, uh, the boats are? That's where all the dudes are, but I don't want to freaking hoist over all those boats. And the problem is, too, we got that, uh, that black pole right there as well. Uh, really big ass. We got a big crew right over here behind us. The guys on the ground just started blowing up our headsets. Definitely a lot of radio chatter. Okay, there's a large opening right uh, behind these uh, trees here. Oh, you got a copy? I got a copy. Okay. Uh, yes, sir, we copy. Uh, we are uh, discussing our hoisting options down by. Well, I would say landing is probably not an option. Yeah. I can't really tell what the uh, scope is like back there. I mean, that would have to be a freaking complete vertical landing into that spot. Yeah, come over to the other side of the street. You'll see a big opening back here where I'm standing up. Let's just check out this open area that he keeps yelling about. Okay. I, I mean, I saw that as we came around. No, I don't think we can go in there. I think that's a stupid idea. What's the uh, altitude right here? 155 feet. Yeah, we've got a couple concerns down here we'll have to look at. Just they got a bunch of boats and real tall trees. It'll make it a little difficult to hoist. It's getting dark outside. When we show up, there's actually a ground party there that's trying to be very helpful. Uh, they cut down what they thought was going to be a uh, suitable landing site for us. But it certainly was not big enough for the H-60 helicopter. So what I'm thinking is, I don't know how you feel about this tall tree right here. If you want to make it a tall hoist. Hey, well, I'm actually happy to, uh, I mean, i got great visibility on that. I'd like to just get Dave on the ground here and let him kind of assess this whole thing for us. OK. This is 110 feet right here. And I think we can safely get right in front of that four-wheeler. Even with that tall tree, if you're 1 o'clock without yeah. clipping it with a blade? We got Dave to the door. I got him hooked up with the hoist. It looked good from there on, so we just held the hover and we sent Dave out the door. Slow check and please, swimmer's on his way down. Roger. It was a very high hoist, over 100 feet, which is the highest I've ever been hoisted. As I was getting lowered down, I got caught up in the trees a little bit. I was able to free myself. And can't tell how far up the deck swimmer is. He is almost on deck. I get on the ground safely and then went 
up to the cabin with the backboard to do my patient assessment. Three eight swimmer, we will need to hoist the patient. And Roger that. How is that spot that we uh, hoisted you down to? Will that work? Uh, yes, sir. That's a good spot. It'll work over. They had the patient inside the cabin, and I saw where she fell, and it looked like a very painful fall off of about a 10-foot balcony. Number three eight. Uh, we're coming into a hover over your position. You guys ready for hoist? Yes, we are ready for hoist. Over. Rescue checklist complete. Ready for one bear hook recovery of the litter with survivor from 110 feet. We get back in the hover over the survivor, and being that high, the survivor started spinning pretty bad. Litter is clear of the deck. Got a spin to it. Hang on, she just don't want her to get sick. Rescue checklist complete. Ready for one bear hook recovery of the litter with survivor from 110 feet. Got into a hover at Taku Inlet. The patient had a possible broken neck and head trauma. Litter is clear of the deck. Got a spin to it. Hang on, she just don't want her to get sick. Stop in the swing. She started spinning pretty bad. There's not a whole lot we can do about it. We just hope she closes her eyes and doesn't puke on the way up. So I try to speed up the hoist as fast as I can, getting her up to the bottom of the helo. All right, litter is inside cabin right now. The dragon survivor in cabin door. Roger. Once Josh gets the patient stable in the helicopter, I hooked up and he picked me up without a hitch. I stayed out of the trees this time and got me in the helicopter. And rescue summer is coming in, Kevin Door. Cool. Voice complete. Once we take off, our only task is to get uh, the helicopter to Juno as quickly as possible. How's the patient? She's in a lot of pain. What happened to her? She fell downstairs. Ooh. Probably have some broken ribs in her back area, but her vitals are good. No internal bleeding. All her vitals were normal. Her breathing was was rapid, mostly due to the pain. And crew report ready for approach. Ready for approach. Gotcha. We were so close to Juno, there really wasn't too much I could do with the small amount of time I had, except ensure that the ambulance would be on scene when we got there. We had called for the ambulance to be at the airport when we landed. Nine times out of 10, they're always there waiting for us. In this particular case, of course, the ambulance wasn't there. It was in route. It was heartbreaking when I had to tell her that the ambulance wasn't there. They were still, still on their way. The whole crew realized how much pain she was actually in at that point. Actually, it's pulling on right now. The ambulance is here. My name is Kathy Thatcher, and I live in Juneau, Alaska. Extreme amount of pain. Oh. So much pain, she's having difficulty breathing. When I lost my balance and was falling, I knew that it wasn't going to be a good situation because I was up about, I'd say, 10 feet, and um, I was going head first. I am so thankful to the crew that responded to my incident. They were wonderful, very professional and helpful and caring. Living in Southeast Alaska, it's just a vital service. We are so remote here that we really, really value the services of the Coast Guard. Brooks Payton said, if you don't win, you're sleeping on the couch tonight. Well, I have duty, sir, so I'll be sleeping now. Uh... <laughs> Lieutenant Brooks Crawford from Air Station Sitka, just out here uh, having a good time on this uh, unit kayak race. Go! We just had two back-to-back -back cases, so it's nice to be able to kick back and have a little fun. Go, Will! My name is Commander Ward Samlin. The individual racers will do a time trial. From there, we take the top four and then they'll do a head-to-head -head race. And then the winners from those two heats will meet in the final, the grand finale, and uh, that'll decide the winner for the day. Go! 
It's awesome opportunity to get out and play a little bit today, do some paddling. Of course, bragging rights are always important. And then uh, the CEO sweetened the deal by uh, throwing in 24 hours of liberty for the winner. <laughs> Rachel <laughs> Youngberg, 426. Three minutes, 52 seconds. Easy. I'm mean, it's David White. Uh, I just did the first leg of this awesome kayak race. I'm gonna win. Woo! 3.49. Oh. Taking the top spot. It's fun. So now we finished up our time trials. Uh, we're moving on to the head-to-head. Uh, -head. Go! First semifinal heat, we have pay officer Chris Miller, then Lieutenant Brooks Crawford. For our second round of semi-finalist heats, we've got Petty Officer Will Beisel against Petty Officer Dave White. Nice job, guys. Dave White. So now we have, going for all the marbles, Dave White and Brooks Crawford. Yeah. Good luck, sir. Good luck, man. <laughs> we'll both give it all we can and see what happens. Going all out in next go. I'm not intimidated at all. Uh -huh. Maybe a little bit. Go. Got sheer power going yeah. for him. Oh, you're trying to go through? Risky maneuver. Oh, it's gonna pay off. It's gonna pay off for Dave. Uh, that might have been the game winner. Yeah, I, it could be. The opportunities to do things outdoors in Alaska are amazing, and it's great for morale. Yeah. yeah. People are happy when they kind of have a little bit of R&R. &R. They work smarter, they work safer. So for me as the commanding officer here, this is not just about everybody having a good time. In, in some small way, it's also about mission readiness. When everybody's improvising, adapting, and overcoming, that epitomizes what Air Station SIT is all about and what we're good at. We succeed when other folks can't. From the flight crews, to the folks who work in the galley, to the folks who buy the parts, to the folks who install the parts. It's amazing, and it really makes me humble that I'm able to be a part of this team. Grand prize, GoPro camera. Thank you, thank you.